dad would feel um, to know how gifted and anointed Emma is. You know, it really is fantastic. And God's calling on her life and, uh, and her dedication to that call is fantastic. And I see the reality of it. I see the genuineness of it. And um, we have many good chats, not least sitting in the restaurant together yesterday uh, for about two and a half hours discussing life and uh, everything else that we covered in that ground. But uh, may the Lord continue to bless you and use you in, in this year. Um, Thank, thanks, Dad. <laughs> isn't it lovely to have family, isn't it? Isn't it a real special treat? And where's David's other, and the other granny? That's David's mum there. Okay. Happy New Year. Did you have a good break? Ours is a bit mad. We were down in Bradford with my sister, uh, Karis, and uh, her three children. And so dad had all six grandchildren in the room at the same time. And then my brother was up, Philip, from the London area with his uh, latest girlfriend. We hope this one's a keeper, but, you know, we've thought that a couple of times before. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, good family time had by all. Um, so I want to bring you this morning some flavor of what I feel like God is saying for 2018. Uh, it's just uh, really the tip of the iceberg as we go through January. I think, Dad, you're preaching next week, and then maybe I'm back on again the week after. You'll get more of a sense of the fullness of what God is doing in this time in uh, the earth. It's a busy year. I think m multiple nations we will set our feet on the grind of. We start next week, no, this Thursday, uh, by ministry in central London. England is the first nation after Scotland that we will go to. But um, so let, let's give you a flavor of it. There will be some up and dining. There will be some turning to each other and praying for each other. There's as much Jesus in all of you as there is in me. I am quite sure you will be a gifted ministry team to one another. So uh, if I say pray for each other, please do that with gusto and with a, a certainty that you don't have an empty head and you don't have empty hands all right you're anointed you're looking at me like oh no she's gonna make me speak out loud and pray it'll be fine so I was doing what I love to do I was uh, uh shopping in Marks and Spencer's do you like the shoes and um uh God said to me go and buy a cushion with a B on it and I'm like, why, God? And he did not tell me why, but I'm obedient, and I'm walking towards the cushion uh, section, and I'm thinking in my head, I don't even like bees. Why do I want a cushion with bees on it? And I bought it and brought it home and said to God, well, where do you want this cushion to go? And God said, I want you to put it in your office, which is where uh, I do most of my sermon prep and prayer, so that you're going to see it, and it will be a reminder every time time you pray. And I'm thinking, okay. Well, later that day, I'm changing the wallpaper screen on my phone. And those of you who've known me for a while know that if you look at the picture image on my phone, it usually is what I feel God is saying for that year or for that moment so that I always keep his word uh, somewhere as a trigger for me to remember. And God says, I want you to put a picture of honey on your phone. And then the Lord says, I want you to put bees and honey in your life this year because it's the year of honey and I want you to remember. So tell your neighbor, it's the year of honey. It's the year of honey. Okay, now 64 times uh, it says, talks about honey in the Bible. Uh, you know that the promised land is a land flowing with milk and honey. You know that manna in the wilderness tastes like honey and coriander apparently and you know that honey is all through the imagery of song of songs as their lips drip with honey uh, and that imagery of sweetness uh, in love john the baptist eats honey as the food of pioneers and you know that this year therefore god is sustaining those who pioneer 
That's an amen right there. Some of you just need to say, I'm grabbing that. God is sustaining those who pioneer. But I felt God really bring to mind two uh, scriptural references uh, for the year of honey. And the first is Psalm 81, verse 16. And it repeats that theme in Deuteronomy 32, 13. And it says this, with honey from the rock, I will satisfy you. With honey from the rock, I will satisfy you. Now, in the Deuteronomy 32, which repeats it, Moses, do you remember? He is singing a song over the children of Israel, and he sings, he nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty crag. And I believe that what the Lord is saying to us this year is, in the place of your stony rockiness, in the place of the boulders and the barrenness and the bleakness of the cliffs, in the things that have you have countered and measured as fruitless and barren, all the places you said to yourself, God, will that ever change? Will there ever be a solution there? Will there ever be a breakthrough? Will there ever be fruit? Will this situation ever be anything other than incredible hard work? I believe that the beauty of this year is that God has promised honey and he will satisfy you in the places where you have battled, where you have felt previously depleted, where you have felt unfruitful, where you have seen an unproductive situation. The Lord says, I am going to turn that around and instead of the dry barrenness of a rock, there will be the production miraculously of honey. Hallelujah. And that word satisfied, I will bring honey from the rock and it will satisfy you. That word in the Hebrew is the word seba. And it means not just lightly satisfy or light touch, but the strong's uh, definition of that Hebrew word means satisfied continually. Drink their fill, feed them to the full, to have in plenty to have it in excess, to have an abundance, to have enough, to have plenty, ripe, satiated, satisfy, and saturated. That's what it means when God says, I will satisfy you with honey from the rock. Now, you and I know honey doesn't come from a rock. Water doesn't come from a rock either, but that didn't stop God earlier in Exodus. And I believe God is saying that he is not confined this year to do the things that we can easily explain. And the place of your battleground in 2018, I prophesy it to you, will become the place of your miracle. And the place of hardship will become the place of sweetness. And I believe God is saying extraordinary provision and extraordinary miracles. When you are hard pressed, we now have to expect. And honey will start to flow in the places you least expect it. So I believe that God is saying, let it linger in your heart. Expect the, it to flow. And maybe you need to draw or buy or get an image of a bee somewhere so that there is a reminder when you are on the edge of yourself that it is in that exact place that the honey starts to come. Now, interestingly, my dear old prophetic friend, Sarah Jane, who I was with yesterday and just in that moment of grief after losing her dad, she turned up. Uh, maybe a month ago and said to me, I just felt God told me to buy this picture for the office. I hope you're going to like it. And it's down in the children's room. It is a beautiful image of bees. And she, of course, ahead of the revelatory curve. And I feel like the Lord is saying, do not fear. I thought dad was going to preach my sermon there at the beginning. Do not fear any longer. And I want to speak that right deeply into your hearts. Do not fear. Don't fear what looks like it might be hard. Don't fear the journey. For the honey is going to be this year. I prophesy it to you in the most unlikely places. Amen. The second story 
in scripture is an unusual one. I'd not read it for a long time. And that is 1 Samuel 14. Now, this is where Jonathan, in the middle of battle, eats honey. It says that an entire army, he was fighting uh, for his father Saul, an entire army entered the woods on the day of battle and honey was on the ground. And then it says that Jonathan's eyes were brightened. Now, I must say I did a fair bit of research into that. Was it, did it just mean that his strength rose again? But the original talks about the brightening and the gleaming of his eyes on the tasting of honey. So you've got to know this means this is a year where you're going to see things in a fresh and renewed way. But the honey, according to that scripture, was oozing out over the forest floor. Is that not a bit strange? Honey was flowing, one translation says. Now, up to this point in battle, the army had grown weary because a few verses before, you see King Saul issue what is a really foolish command. He says that the army are to fight without eating. Who thinks that's a good military strategy? Don't feed your troops and then let them fight. And so you have an, an exhausted military battalion. And Jonathan dips the tip of his staff in the honey and his eyes gleam. He sees better. He feels better. He is reinvigorated. He is refreshed. And I believe that what the Lord is saying, because remember this is refreshing in the backdrop of foolish decisions from King Saul, that in the midst of of foolish decisions that you have made. I'm sure I'm not talking to anybody in this room. Those listening online. In the midst of the foolishness of some decisions where you've thought, why did I do that? In the midst of the battles, there will be a turnaround moment from God where provision and sweetness will come that will refresh and brighten you even though you are not deserving of it because of previous foolishness. Hallelujah, Jesus. And honey, as you know, is a metaphor in scripture for all good things. It's God's blessing. It's God's abundance. It's enjoyment. It's the Old Testament's way of saying, because of how they use it as a commodity and of gifts. It's the Old Testament's way of saying what is pure and what is valuable. And some of you who work in catering and food will know that honey is one of a very small list of food items that don't spoil. Salt is one of the others, pure alcohol, pure maple syrup for our Canadians, uh, uh, are, don't spoil. And we know that honey has been found unspoilt in some of the Egyptian tombs hundreds and hundreds of years later, and it was still edible. It keeps indefinitely. And what I believe God is saying is, I will not give you a short reprise that will just give you strength for a couple of weeks so you will cycle in boom and busts. But I am going to give you a release of honey that will not fade, that will not spoil, that will not be lost because you had some breakthroughs before and then they got lost. But honey will last and my gifts will last and I feel that the Lord is saying it is truly the year of good gifts in hard places. This is the year of honey. And I felt like God was saying we needed to commission each other, commission each other again to go into battle, commission each other to fight, to leap again into an adventure, to commission you to thrive even if your previous decisions were poor. And at the moments of need, at the point where it looks like a crisis, there will be the honey of God. And the Lord is saying you're going to have to let go of your fears on the back of this word and go again. So let's jump to our feet. And we're just going to make a decree. So if you can repeat after me, I believe you, Jesus, I believe you, Jesus. 
that there will be honey and provision and solution this year in the hard places. Now, some of you can come and grab these bottles of oil, and we are just going to spend two or three minutes to come, and, yeah, and we're just going to um, anoint each other's foreheads, and we are going to, somebody come and thank you, uh, fire them out. If you've got oil in your handbags, many of our guys have oil in their handbags. So f- get into a, a, a pairs or twos or threes, whatever you're comfortable with, it, you know, just find yourself in a little team If you're not used to doing this, some of the GPC folk, make sure that people are standing uh, with one of you near them. Nicola, can you join these two gentlemen here? And we are just going to, to, to anoint the forehead. Now, why, if you just stay with me, because you need to know what to say. We are commissioning you to go again. What are we commissioning you to do? To go again. And I believe that as you are commissioned to go again some of the long-standing anxiety and fear issues that you have are going to be killed in the moment of the anointing of God and that there will be an ability to go ahead knowing that God has promised honey rather than that gray uh, barren dry place that you ended up in in points of last year so on you go i commission you to go again i kill your fear in jesus name i kill your fear in jesus name i commission you to go again i kill your fear in jesus name Make sure. Do you have oil there? Okay, that's that'll do. Okay. Val. I don't know where that is. So in, do you want to just raise your hands towards me and just catch the blessing as I pray for you? No, you're all right. In the name of Jesus, I commission you to go again this year. I speak to all fear and tension and stress and anxiety in your bodies. We kill it and demand it to leave in the mighty name of Jesus. And we say to you that hope now rises within you again and that there will be the tasting of honey in the rock this year in Jesus name. Amen. Have a seat. Good job. Oh, tissues. Did you spill it? (laughs) Okay. Now, I also believe that the Lord said, point two, that we are entering the year of physical strength. And anybody need an amen for that? Amen. In a year of physical strength. And you know the scripture in Isaiah 40 verse very well. Uh, it, actually, it was one of the first things God said to me. I said, what do you want me to talk about this year? And all he would tell me for days was the word strength. That's, and he wouldn't even unpack it. That's all he said to me. Strength, strength. It's a year of strength. It's a year of strength. Do you not know, Isaiah 40, 28, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now you and I know that you only need a verse like this because you have fallen, because you are weary, because you have failed and because you are tired. 
And I love that that scripture says even. Even the best get worn out. Even the young and the fit fail and fall. And I felt like God was saying to us, you have had the fall. You have had the stumble. You have had the tiredness. You have had the weariness. But now is the year of strength returning to your muscles and your sinews. And I felt like the Lord was saying it wasn't about getting us back to just an even keel. But as that scripture implies, it's the strength not to walk, but the strength to run again and to not be tired in the running. Now, running and not being tired has to be a miracle. And I believe God is saying my strength is coming back physically to my people and it will come with such a force that it will shock you. And you and I know there are times when all you've got is waiting. There are times when all you've got is that you've got to hold on to hope. There are times when all you have got is weariness that come from the previous season. And then we hit moments where we hit the fulfillment of the word of God. And we have quoted this scripture in checkups and in ministries over people, probably one of the most common things we have to lay hands and minister into people's lives. But I felt like God say, this is the year of the fulfillment of this scripture. And this is the time where strength is coming after your weariness. So jump to your feet and let's just pray. You could look a little bit more excited, okay? Because this is good stuff. Who? If you have actually physical pain in your body, can you put your hand in the air? Somebody quickly just lay hands. Oh my goodness, look at that. Can you, those round about them, just be the ministry team and lay hands on them. You're all going to have to be the ministry team because there's a lot with physical pain. You may have to put your hands on two people. Just start to, to, to move. And we'll do weariness next because actually there's too many of you in physical pain. And let's just, we love these people. Let me pray, but you just work with me on it and just pray as well and we'll do it all at the same time. Father God, we believe your word and we just speak that the pain comes off and that the strength returns and we say the pain comes off and the strength returns. Come on, minister it to them. The pain comes off and the strength returns. The pain comes off and the strength returns and in the mighty name of Jesus, we speak to that word wearying spirit of infirmity and we say you are banished and you are removed from their lives in the mighty name of Jesus and we say that the pain in their bodies comes to an end because of the cross and we speak over you that by his stripes you are healed and I say in the name of Jesus that strength rises 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 in the mighty name of Jesus be healed Some of you just got a miracle right there. Can you just stay standing and wave at me if you think I have been just weary. I mean, it has been overwhelmingly weary. That's, again, be the ministry team. That's a lot of people. Keep your hand in the air until somebody lays hands on you, okay? Just keep, yeah, come come and be the ministry team. Again, we're just going to pray. We banish the stronghold of weariness. And we say that that assignment of the devil to keep you down and under is blocked and stopped and removed. And we speak an energy not just to your body, but to your thinking and to your emotions that the speed of God would come back to you. And anything that has been robbed in the last year where things did not go well 
because of the weariness and you didn't have the energy to break through, we now catch that robbing spirit and we say, what was stolen from you last year, according to the word of God, when the robber is caught, it has to be repaid at least seven times over. And so we say this is a year not just of the strength rising, but of the repaying of what you lost in your place of weariness. And we say strength rises, strength rises, strength rises, strength rises, strength rises, strength rises right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Can you get your wallets, diaries, phones out? We're going to pray for them. I want to explain why. Wallets, diaries, phones, things to do with your calendar, your money, your your appointment keeping, those kind of things. For me, it's paper diaries. I'm still on paper diaries. Some of you are more advanced technically than I am. Okay. Ooh, somebody need to get keys out. I didn't, hadn't written that down, but some of those of you who are moving house need to get keys. Yeah, yeah, that just. Oh, you can grab my keys. The back pocket, my handbag. All right. So, talking to God about this year, he showed me a metronome. Somebody give me a definition of a metronome, a musical person. Louder, Heather. Pendulum. Okay. So it is not a clock, but it is set, is my understanding. I remember David practicing his trumpet with a metronome sitting on top of the piano, and we used to have one in the house. But it marks the correct rhythm or the correct pace, and it can be set according to whatever is happening in the music at that point. And I heard the Lord say, perhaps one of the most peculiar things I'd ever heard him say, he said, I want to give you the gift of being measured. And I screwed up my face and thought, hang on a minute. What about wild and passionate God measured? But the Lord said to me, it's not measured as in slow. It's measured as in, in my timings. And the Lord says, I want to give you the gift of my measuredness that you may get back your intentionality. Anybody feel, I've lost the ability to be intentional. Things just happen to me rather than actually I'm deliberately choosing. That is about to be overturned. And the Lord says, you'll get your measure, my measure, you'll get your intentionality, you'll get get the ability to be deliberate so that you do not have life happen to you where you're tossed about by every wind, but that God is going to set a rhythm and a pattern that he has approved. A God-approved diary, a God-approved pace, a God-approved approach, not over-anxious, not running to stress at the first thought as your first thought not manic and pushing not lagging behind and slow but I believe that the Lord is going to give a gift where his beat is rhythmically paced out and it will become so obvious that it will be easy to follow now the concept of God um, having a measure or a measure of God uh, is very uh, scriptural God measures out the heavens yes but it's twice in Ephesians, Ephesians 3, I pray that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Or Ephesians 4, that you will attain the full measure of God. And I think there's a sense of God saying, look, I have a measurement that is right for you. And the word measure in scripture is the word metron, which is probably where we get metronome from. But it is a rhythm that brings you back into fullness. Did you get that? It is a measure that brings you back into fullness. It is a measure of God that you can handle. It's not short and lacking and his measure decides what is right for you. So let's jump to our feet.
Now, if we had breakthrough with laying hands on our own phones and keys before, we would have had breakthrough. So now you know that you need another pair of anointed hands. And hallelujah, the person next to you has them. All right, so turn. Uh, probably not. Let's, let's split up from being in family groups because you've probably done battle already. And get somebody else to lay hands on your phone and your keys, whatever uh, represents the, how you order and structure your life. I actually believe there's an order coming to finances. As a hallelujah that right there, there is an order and the measure of God coming into finances. If you need to move around the room, feel free to move around the room. So we just call order and the measure of God. Just start praying. We call order and the measure of God. Order and the measure of God. Order, order and the measure of God. We speak the order of God into diaries. The order of God into where we live. The order of God into our finances. That the full measure of God would come. And Lord, we ask that you would now give us the ability to keep at your pace. Lord, that we would not be those who run ahead or lag behind. But we speak the measure of God. The measure of God, it's the gift, it's the gift of God, it's the gift of God, the order and the measure of God, the order and the measure of God, right places to live, right things to do at the right time, not too busy, not too bored. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Father, thank you for what you are doing. The measure of God, the measure of God. Have a seat. Final one. So the final thought for this morning of what God is doing, this will take me a little bit longer to unpack. I had a dream recently where um, I was writing sermon notes in the dream, pages of handwritten notes. And when I reviewed them, there was only one sentence that I could read. And this sentence so arrested my heart and ricocheted around my spirit, and it, it still does. This is all in dream, in the dream. And the sentence that I could read was this. We are more fascinated with ourselves than we are with Jesus. We are more fascinated with ourselves than we are with Jesus. And so I said, God, why do you want us to see that above everything else that could be important for 2018? God, why don't you tell me about the government or the finances or the euro or Brexit? And God said, no, this is the most important thing on my heart this year, that my people are more fascinated with themselves than they are with my son. And I believe that God wants to release a new holy fascination with Jesus. And that this is the year of knowing God like you have never known him before. And for many of you, you are about to walk into a great refreshing regarding your fascination with Jesus because it's been lost and just the relationship with God has been incredibly hard work for some of you. I would go as far as to say I believe that this is the year of the awakening of a Jesus obsession. That we are being pulled into another level of utter enthrallment with all that he is. And that God is going to help us to develop a holy fascination which will end the days of our self-fascination. I believe that there will be a manifestation of the spirit of the fear of the Lord that is going to hover weightily.
and it will transition us all. In fact, I believe that the Lord said to me that we are about to go on a major cultural course correction. And I don't mean, oh, you know, course correction culturally out there where we see the errors of uh, the, the, uh, the world, but actually a cultural course correction in the house of God where the church culture gets so reordered that it is almost unrecognizable from what it is in its current form because of the coming manifestation and our partnership with it of the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And in turn, it will start to radically impact the culture out there. And I believe that Jesus is shining a light on a major issue that has kept the church painfully disconnected from him and it is our independent spirit and our self-fascination and this independent spirit and our self-fascination we know is crippling us but it is also crippling our society in john 8 jesus is saying at the beginning of the chapter oh i'm the light of the world and you know that chapter well but of course, it's immediately contended by the Pharisees. And by verse 42, 44, in the dialogue that goes back between Jesus and the Pharisees, Jesus issues a stern and alarming warning to the gathered people. And he accuses the Jewish crowd of serving Satan as their father because of their desire to murder him. And Jesus is making clear that what you desire is not always your own independent desire, but it's the desire handed down to you of whoever fathers you. And Jesus in this scripture is setting up a choice between two models, between two fathers. He's saying, look, either your God, your father is God Almighty, or your father is Satan. That seems fairly straightforward. But I have to say, I think we believe that there is a third option. And it is the major error of our days. I can have God as my father. I can have Satan as my father. Or I can be my own independent boss. That's what we have added to the biblical text. Oh, I can be independent. I can think my own autonomous, isolated thoughts. I can think for myself. I can govern myself. I am going to go off and I'm going to do this alone. I'm going to be fascinated with me. I'm following God. I'm following Satan. Or I'm following myself. And if I don't like it, I'm going to walk away. And if it doesn't suit me, I'm not going to play. And this creation of this independent self has truly undermined people's bonds with each other. And there are, we have a crisis, I think, in our commitment levels. And we have trained a generation to not stay and to not work things out relationally. And the Bible only allows for two options. It only allows for God or Satan. And driven by pride, Satan expresses his desire to replace God by making himself like God. And every time we partner with the desire to follow ourselves, we are unconsciously mimicking Satan's pride. There's no gray area in scripture. There's no compromise zone. And this third way of life where you rule yourself, nobody is going to tell me what to do, ever, is simply a disguised version of copying the desires of Satan. And I think controlling your own world, it sounds really appealing, doesn't it? You can nod. I know it's serious, but come on, work with me. We actually think, oh, if if I'm in charge of my world, you know, I'm free. But could we actually be slaves to how Satan thinks? Could it be 
that our great push towards independence is the greatest form of demonic slavery in our culture. Does not freedom come in imitating Christ? And he sets us free in a family of interdependence and relationship and not independence. So how, how did our culture get here? Because we, we know we, our culture is there. How do we so easily think that self-rule and independence is a good thing? I believe that Satan started to erase himself from human awareness and started to convince himself, convince us of our own self-sufficiency. So you see in the writings, you know, from the late 19th century into the early 20th century, that Satan starts to become uh, almost a comic uh, character. He loses a sense of supernatural reality. He's got red horns. He's got red tights. He's got a pointy tail. He's got a pitchfork. He's almost like a little, small, playful beast. Now, Andrew Del Banco, in the book, The Death of Satan talks about how Satan vanished as a reality from our culture. And we completely reorganized reality. We lost a grip on truth. We lost our common enemy. Stay with me. This is really important. Now, when God says in Exodus 3, I am, and he calls himself the great I am, he's saying, look, I'm almost indescribable. Well, who knows that Satan always speaks the opposite? So Satan comes along and says, okay, if you're going to be the great I am, I'm going to be the great I am not. I'm not real. And following yourself is not following me. And Satan makes himself invisible to us. And that's why we say, oh, well, there, 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 are, more demons. there are more demons in other, uh, other nations than there are in, in the West, uh, you know, first world. Oh, hang on a minute. It's just that the enemy knew our culture and made himself invisible here and made us more fascinated with ourselves. And we became gods in our own eyes and we became independent and we became self-governing when we forgot that we have a king. And with no enemy and with no Satan, we have hit our greatest cultural crisis. Because independence and pride, the sin most closely associated with the devil, has become a virtue, has it not? And pride in yourself, once the mark of Satan, is now not just some uncontested emotion, it is now our God. And every person who imitates Satan's desire to be one's own God is associating themselves with Satan as father. Now, this next sentence really, really matters. So tell your neighbor you need to hear this. You need to hear this. When you stop believing in Satan, or the culture does, when you disregard the reality of the demonic, you leave the culture defenseless against evil. Why? Because there is no absolute evil. When you're all independent and there is no Satan, you're allowed to believe whatever you like. And there is no valid way of saying sin is sin. Because evil doesn't exist. I'm my own God, what I say goes. And it's, it's what we face every day. When my children come to me and they say to me, Mommy, tell me again, give me the language again when I'm in school uh, of why Jesus thinks homosexuality is wrong. Give me the language that explains it. And actually, you and I know that when we're trying to tell our children why Jesus says that, it almost feels like we've got a we're lost cause. How, how do we begin to put words on that without sounding savagely judged? judgmental and when we don't believe in satan as a culture and we don't believe in evil and we don't believe in the sin that he uses and loves us to engage with we become independent gods and there's no way that we can speak as we have hurt find that actually we think something is wrong in our culture are you tracking with me 
So how do you heal the culture? You need a refreshing of the doctrine that says this, I believe Satan exists. I believe Satan exists. Like Michael Green wrote, do you remember anybody read his book in the early 80s, I Believe in Satan's Downfall? Yeah? Some of you nodding. Which is really saying, look, I believe in the concept of good and evil. I believe in the concept of truth and lies. And the choice to follow Jesus or Satan and which one you're going to imitate is the choice actually to be humble or pride. And Satan says, oh, no, no, it's not about me and Jesus. It's not about Lucifer and Christ. It's not that black and white. It's wonderfully gray. And the choice is whatever makes you feel good or Jesus. And if we are to model Christ, we have to relinquish all our pride because it is satanic. So let me pose a disturbing question. Can you be a successful Christian? Can you be a successful imitator of Jesus if you're independent? It's so countercultural, isn't it? Jesus, how independent am I really? How much am I yielded to you? Do I think it's good to be independent? I bet if we took a straw poll on the street, 100% would say it is good to be independent. Or do I think it's good to be submitted? And independent means not depending on another. Self-sufficient, self-supporting, self-sustaining, self-reliant, self-standing. Self-contained, self-made. And we like to dress up the word individual, don't we? And we like to say, oh, it's through free thinking. It's individualistic. It's unconventional. I'm a bit of a maverick. We like to think we're outside anyone's control. But is not the essence of our faith that I surrendered my life and I have become totally dependent on mercy and grace because I could not make it on my own. And I chose at the moment of salvation to yield myself to another's authority. You could not. And could it be the very thing that we see culturally as a virtue, that wanting to govern my own affairs is the very behavior that made Satan fall? I've read a number of articles over the years about good leadership. Uh, One in particular uh, caught my eye. The 10 things that the best leaders never, ever say. I'm the boss being at the top. Because, of course, once you say it, you negate it. I'm the boss. I'll do it myself is another one good leaders never say. Because the more gifted you are in leadership, the more you are raising people up and you're doing things through and for other people. Another one is, I know that. I've thought of everything. And for me, the biggest one of all, and it is hugely telling in emails, is the use of the word I. Because it makes you sound bloated in your own importance. And so we are used to emails that say, I would like you to do this. Rather than, it would be great if you would consider this. Or, I think this is awful rather than having reflected on the matter, perhaps this is not the best. So when David and I get copy to edit for our website or Lion Bites or other things, emails that are going out to the database, the first thing we do is delete the word I from any of our correspondence because it lacks inclusiveness. And it promotes the concept of self rather than the team. And it is shocking to read emails and to see how independent and self-fascinated most of our communication with each other is. So I'm going to set you a challenge. Can you write emails without the word I in them? 
I am writing. You know, that's fairly obvious. <laughs> that's my particular. <laughs> I actually think that in a moment of frustration, there's so many times I want to write this probably not gracious, you would never think this, you're far more gracious than I. I think you've done a really bad job, or I am so annoyed, or I want you to tell me right now how this has happened. And I have to make myself stop and find a more loving, shepherding niceness and rephrase what's inside of me. But actually what that does is it faces me, forces me to face the ugly truth that I'm fascinated with myself on occasions. So let me wrap this up in some way. We are going to get the opportunity to medicate our culture this year like never before. And we are going to start to talk about the reality of Satan. And it will start to hang in the atmosphere. And it will start to give back to the people the sense that there is an absolute wrong and an absolute right. Do not underestimate what some of your conversations will do in changing the atmosphere, even if there's not even a non-Christian present, but just speaking the reality into the atmosphere. So we're going to talk about the fact that we believe Satan exists but the second and the most important thing we're going to say is we're going to turn, like the angels do, towards the face of our Father God. And we are going to say, who is like you, God? And the cry, who is like you, God, is a cry that crushes the devil and it crushes your own independence and it crushes your own self-fascination. Who is like you, God, is like picking up a sword and driving it through the heart of Satan and it will stop him hissing, oh, you can be a God. And who is like you, God, is going to be the phrase that we sing in the streets, that our intercessors go out and spray on the land everywhere they go, that we say to each other at, at, in every worship session that we have in this building. That's the aim anyway. Who is like you, God, is now the anointed cry of 2018. It should be the first thing you say in the morning when you get up. It needs to be the last thing you say at night before you go to bed and clearly and with articulation and sometimes with a violence in your voice you are going to say who is like you God and it is going to start to bring a reordering into the atmosphere of the nation now where will this take us why is this important because we are on the cusp of a revival and an awakening in the nation where the holiness of God and the contrasting sin of Satan is seen. And I am prophesying into the nation right now. It is not, this is really important. This course correction is going to start with us, but it is going to seep over the boundaries of the church and into the nation. And this is so important. People will not just fall in love with Jesus and keep their sin, which we have seen for decades, but but people are going to fall in love with Jesus and they are going to fall out of love with Satan and themselves. That is the major course correction that is going to come. And we are going to see the fulfillment of Psalm 45 verse 7 where it says this, you love righteousness and you hate wickedness. And this loving of righteousness and this hating of wickedness are going to be gifts that God is going to give to a cultural mess as we start to partner with the fear of the Lord. And the Lord is saying, uh, again, do, uh, do you remember what I said in, in Nove last November when God said, what kind of revival do you want? Do you remember that? And you can nod at me. Those what kind of revival do you want? And God says, you can have the soft, gentle water revival that drips over you and you lie on your back on the floor and you feel 
feel really great, but actually the culture doesn't change. Or you can contend for the revival of the fire and the fear of the Lord that will come in the dark glory cloud that God lives in because we know he lives in a cloud according to scripture that is brooding and flashing with lightning. And the Lord is saying that this year that there will be a move to be on our knees, not on our backs, where the holiness movement comes again as Satan is seen as real and the church starts to heal the culture. So what to expect in 2018? Being on your knees. What to expect in 2018? Turning the tide of the culture by saying, I believe in Satan's downfall and who is like our God and putting back the two options on the agenda of the nation and so undermining the third option of self. What else for 2018? We're going to practice the art of Jesus' fascination. We're going to practice a new level of yielded submission. We're going to practice the art of belonging. And I'll say more about this um, uh, when I'm preaching again. We are going to practice the art of interdependence, of being a family, of making our weaknesses and our needs known. And in 2018, I prophesy, we are going to see the greatest cultural healing we have seen for years because the fear of the Lord and the love of righteousness and the hating of wickedness will prevail in the culture once again. Amen. Please stand up. Uh, We have to start by repenting, don't we? I'd love to do that for you. You know you have to do that yourself. Okay? So am I give some words, but let it be from your own heart, not just mimicking what I'm saying. Oh, Father, we come to you in a time of need, both personally and nationally. Father, where we want to repent of every partnership with independence. Father, every time we said, I'm not going to let anyone tell me what to do. I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to go off on my own. Father, every time those were our ways, oh Lord, have mercy on us. Father, where we had inverted your fathering and made ourselves our own boss and thought that being independent was some way Christian, God have mercy. We repent and ask, Lord, for your forgiveness. Father, I ask that you would give us the fear of the Lord. And would you teach us to say, who is like you, God? Over and over and over. Till all that is broken is reordered in light of your fathering and your kingship. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dad, it's time for communion. Okay, would you like to take a seat, please? And could somebody, uh, Daniel, could you bring in the children, please? It's great that after a word like that, we can just end by focusing on Jesus and on the wine and the bread. You know, the symbolism becomes very vivid for us because it's what I'm going to do with the bread that really speaks to us. It's what we do with the cup. It's the body that is broken that we remember. It is the cup that we drink. You know, some of the reformers like Zwingli and, and a lot of Baptists, and my roots are in Baptist denomination, they were great followers of Zwingli. And they said that the communion service is purely symbolic. And my reply to my fellow Baptists when they were saying to me, John, it's purely symbolic. Well, I said, why do we eat it? And why do we drink it? Why did Jesus tell us to do that? If it is purely and absolutely only symbolic, don't I just need to look at it? Why does Jesus then tell me to eat it? There is something else going on in the spiritual realm here that um, some parts of the church have yet to explore. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not taking that into another direction that some churches do. 
but I think there is something in the breaking of the bread and the eating of it and the drinking of it. And I think we have forgotten um, a phrase in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul says, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And one of the things that communion is, it is a proclamation. And it is a proclamation in three areas and in three directions. One, towards our fellow believers. Secondly, it is a proclamation to the world. And perhaps even thirdly, more important, it is a proclamation to the unseen world, to the angels, both good and bad, and to the spirits, both good and bad. It is a proclamation to the whole universe of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an authoritative and a powerful declaration of that reality. Now you may say, well, I've never made a proclamation like that. I'm not a preacher. I don't stand out in front of congregations. But it is of tremendous spiritual significance to you, even just as an individual, that you understand that taking the bread and the wine is a proclamation that you are making. You are proclaiming to the whole universe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died and shed his blood on your behalf to redeem you. And you are proclaiming that reality and your faith in him as savior, your faith in his atoning death on your behalf. And that is so important. And why is it important? And why do you have to do it regularly? Because as Paul in that same passage goes on to say, he says you do this as a remembrance of Jesus Christ. You know, I meet many people who say, I'm not sure God loves me. I'm not sure how God feels about me. I think sometimes he feels okay about me and sometimes, well, I don't really know how he feels about me. What do I do in those circumstances? Do I then go and find a counselor and say...